some companies that are a bit further ahead in leadership development have invested in developing their managers to have those skill sets, right? And they're focusing often on creating a coaching culture internally. So I think that that's the ultimate goal. And, you know, last year I ran a session on coaching for collaboration because it doesn't necessarily have to be a skill set that a, a manager has. It can really be a skill set that everyone in the workforce develops to be able to collaborate, help each other explore different perspectives and approaches, and to really use that diversity of thought that a company has more fully. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Defo Data Channel podcast. I'm your host Deepak and with me we have Cassia Google. With a diverse background in working with leaders from prestigious companies such as Amazon, Cisco and LinkedIn and startups in India, Singapore and the US. Cassia brings a wealth of industry, cultural and cross-functional expertise to a partnership. Her belief in the power of trust, unlocking potential and equipping modern leaders with coaching skills has led her clients to achieve remarkable results, making her one of the top coaches in Victoria for 2022 and 2023. It's a pleasure to have you here today, Cassia, and thank you for accepting my invitation. Oh, my pleasure to be here with you as well. So I have a couple of questions and uh, so my first one. In terms of AI supporting our focus and capacity, so what specific areas or tasks do you envision AI being most beneficial in enhancing human performance? I think that a lot of that we don't even know yet because having worked with some of the people that work with AI quite closely, I know that this is an area that even the creators of AI are still exploring and discovering. And, you know, I today actually had a conversation with a founder who is 14 years old. She was sharing some of the things that they are working on in medicine and healthcare as far as treating depression, cancer, to create more targeted medicines. So that's an application that I think is going to be huge because it's going to allow for targeted medications that are more specific and it will be more affordable. You know, so I'm excited about what's starting to emerge as possibility and and seeing where AI can make a big difference, certainly in the medical field. That's where I started my career working in clinical trials. So it's great to see some developments there. Um, but I also think also it can really enable us by taking over certain tasks and freeing us up for things that we really want to focus on. You know, a lot of the, the clients that I work with, the leaders have very little time for strategy for self-care for creativity i'm hoping that you know this, this idea of having a personal assistant will start to create more space for them to be able to really utilize their time in a way that they want to so uh how do you define the qualities and characteristics of effective leadership in terms of technological advancements and uncertainty and like what traits do you believe for, are crucial for leaders to possess in order to navigate and thrive towards rapidly evolving field? Well, I would say that the most important skills for leaders today to develop are coaching skills. And this is something that I've been seeing happen over the last 10 years uh, as a leadership coach. And while I was working in Australia, I was actually starting to do training on coaching skills at some of the larger banks there several years ago. That time, there was maybe one person, if any, in the room of say 30 managers who knew what coaching actually meant. And generally it was, you know, mistaken for for mentoring uh, or consulting, giving advice. And I think that it's going to be a really important skill now because it's really about being able to guide someone to explore new situations and what they want to achieve to help find a path to, to get there. And so because it's about navigating new territory and navigating change, it's a tool that's going to help support teams leaders, everyone actually, to be able to navigate through the disruption, through the change, to assess where we're at, where we need to be, and the gap 
that we need to cross, the, the bridge that we need to create to be able to get to our goals. So that's what I think, you know, is, is extremely important for organizations to be investing in, because I do see that a lot of leaders aren't really equipped to handle change well. That's something that comes up quite often, because every time there's a restructure happening, especially recently in the tech industry, the restructure has a huge consequence on everybody around and often leaders just do not have that skill set to be able to handle that in a way that really supports everybody with the support that they need at that time. Right, right. I agree, actually. So regarding companies' investments in skill sense, talent growth, like how can organizations strike a balance between employee engagement and ensuring a return of investments? And like, are there any strategies which you can actually recommend? Yeah, I think, you know, it's about taking uh, the opportunity to develop skills internally. I think it's important that for sure there's investment in all leaders, both executives and managers should actually have coaching skills themselves. You know, traditionally been an external skill set, which executive coaches like myself have provided to executives at organizations, right? More recently, it's been starting to be available to managers to have the support of a coach. Some companies that are a bit further ahead in leadership development have invested in developing their managers to have those skill sets, right? And they're focusing often on creating a coaching culture internally. So I think that that's the ultimate goal. You know, last year I ran a session on coaching for collaboration because it doesn't necessarily have to be a skill set that a, a manager has. It can really be a skill set that everyone in the workforce develops to be able to collaborate, help each other explore different perspectives and approaches to really use that diversity of thought that a company has more fully. So that's my vision, you know, that I think would really enable a company to thrive and have a healthy workplace culture, which creates engagement, but also creates better results because we know that when we have diversity of thought, we get more innovation and we tend to arrive at, you know, more creative solutions than we've been able to before. Right, right. So uh, in your view, like what specific coaching skills are, do you believe are essential for leaders to possess in order to effectively help their fellow teammates and employees to actually adapt to this rapidly changing landscape? Sure. Well, the first one that I think is important is to think about the mindset before we actually talk about the skills. One of those you know, main things is to try to remove that sense of judgment and blame. If you see somebody, what they might call underperforming or doing something that you don't think is the right thing, try to approach them with a sense of curiosity to understand where was the breakdown in performance? What, what is it that caused that? Was it a lack of training? Was it a lack of clear expectations? Because often there's some third factor, not that person themselves, that is creating that situation. So being able to really, you know, take that curiosity in conversations and not immediately imply that they're, they're bad at what they're doing, etc., creates a space for that person to be able to improve and build their skills. And that's extremely important because if somebody feels like you don't believe in them, then they're unlikely to do better. If they feel that you actually trust in them and that they can do better, they will want to do that. It's an internal motivation. And I know that uh, Warren Buffett, he used to really uh, highlight his executive team and a lot of um, praise and uh, positive, you know, comments about their performance. And his expectation was that they would live up to that. <laughs> so, you know, that's an incredibly important piece of this. And it takes practice for that because it's easy to be in that that pattern and habit of blaming and judging people, especially if uh, a manager is stressed on a regular basis. So there's that self-management piece that sort of sets the foundation. And then, of course, you know, the typical skills that often organizations do train on, such as listening, asking questions that really help people think things through. The listening piece isn't necessarily a new skill, but it's a skill that requires a bit of 
desire <laughs> to practice because often people want to jump in with their own ideas and solutions or a manager may be used to being the the problem solver of everything and jump into every problem themselves and solve it on behalf of their team. That's a, a typical habit that I see and that tendency to think that they have to be the hero with all the answers, which is a more traditional model of leadership. Stopping that takes a bit of effort. It's more really about starting to invest more time to just understand the situation and what support that person needs to help them navigate the situation for themselves. And that builds the capability of that, that person and the team. Usually within a few months, they're able to handle a lot more challenging situations themselves. And then the, the prize at the end of that is that the leader will usually have more time to focus, you know, on strategy, on self-care, etc. Yeah, that's a great thought, actually. So with the rapid advancements in technology, so there are concerns about job replacement and the impact on the workforce. How can leaders address these concerns and foster a sense of security and growth among employees in terms of technological advancements? Well, look, I don't think it's significantly different than what we've already been seeing. We've already been dealing with a lot of change. It's been ramping up over a period of time, right? So I think it's just skill development in all areas, the technical skills and the soft skills. That's where energy and time needs to go because there's no stopping these changes. It's really paying attention to what's happening because I think human beings have that tendency to show up a little bit late sometimes. You know, we have a lag time, climate change, and there's a bit of uh, reluctance to believe that a change is happening, right? We know that whenever there's a big change, there's a bit of resistance and denial. And that's a common human reaction if we look at the traditional change curve, which was, I think, a helpful way to understand that a lot of humans will respond that way. So how can we help them to upskill, to cope with these changes in the company. And so we already talked about the importance of coaching skills so we can understand where are these people at? Are they in denial? Are they in resistance? Or are they starting to explore this change? You know, are they starting to understand what this might mean? And um, I think that that's the biggest challenge with AI is that a lot of people don't really understand the technology they're starting to see, you know, that it can do this and this and that. I know I've had the creators tell me that they don't yet understand, as I mentioned. It's an ongoing thing that we have to keep up with and keep learning. There's definitely going to be a requirement for us to either adapt and learn, or there are going to be people probably like my parents who will never, ever <laughs> get to wrap their heads around some of these changes in technology. Right. In the context of AI's potential recently when generative AI and other sort of uh, like chat GPT sort of algorithms came into being, how do you see the role of leaders evolving and what new skills or competencies do you think leaders need to acquire in order to actually be successfully like leading their teams to success? Well, like I said, I think navigating change is going to be the most important, right? And so the coaching skills are a part of that. But of course, being able to empathize, these softer skills are going to become even more important because they are going to need to understand where people are at. And they're going to need to care about that because if people are lost, that, gonna, that is going to affect productivity, right? It's going to affect engagement. You know, as a leader, I think it's really important that you know where your team members are at in terms of their development. And that's something that often I find a lot of leaders don't know because they're very focused on projects and understanding where those projects are at, but not necessarily understanding where the human being is at in their development. So asking different types of questions to understand more about the person is what's what's really needed, I think. Ironically, right? Because we're using more technology, but it's more of that human focus, I think, that's gonna, you know, the best companies that keeps those companies in the top spot because they understand who they're working with and what those people need. And uh, as a follow-up, there will be 
folks who will be kind of embracing the change or like some will be definitely resisting it what can leaders take measures in way the folks which are actually having this kind of resistance towards adapting to technologies well you know there may be people that don't ever adapt right so that's the first step i think just being honest and understanding are people willing to learn do they have that desire to grow in these areas or is it something that they're not interested in not at all because it may require a different path right so first just that honesty and transparency as much as possible but for that to be possible we need trust which is not always you know there already that takes time to to build for people to be honest about whether they're willing to develop in different areas you know second it's helping to guide them and to encourage them because there are a lot of people that don't have the belief that they can learn or to to take on certain experiences usually they'll keep that to themselves right but imposter syndrome is very prevalent so there may be people that are scared that they may not be able to keep up supporting those people you know is is really important because there's the technology piece which we don't know that much about yet and there's also the human piece where that person's confidence in dealing with technology and change is an important part that relationship right between the two i absolutely agree with you in the realm of uh, ai ethics this is something which i really wanted to actually ask so uh, what are your thoughts on the responsible use of ai to avoid potential pitfalls and ensure that ai technologies are developed and like it's kind of deployed in the rightful manner like this is something which i have observed like not every organization or leadership team knows the real chaos that AI solutions can actually create or like form in in production so like what are some of the things that can kind of uh, leadership team can do to kind of foster this kind of a responsible use of AI within their team and like how to actually build a responsible AI solution yeah i mean that's a huge question right that we we don't have an answer to yet and i guess it depends on what level we're looking at i think that there's a real lack of leadership overall right we don't have any leadership yet by government by some of these potential helpful you know institutions that could take action and i think that this is why we've seen the interview by some of the ex google leaders warning about these things to to take action So, you know, I think that that's the first step is that we need some overarching leadership from some of these thought leaders, from some of these companies rather than the competition that's driving everybody forward. We would re- really benefit from some co- collaboration, right? And some joint decision. I think perhaps we need a body of governance that doesn't exist yet. And the question is whose job is it to to create that, right? Because we see that happening for cybersecurity, we see collaborative forces coming together globally for that but i haven't seen that for ai as far as you know leadership teams i think that that's the question you were asking me i think that they're going to be far far more behind right and really the only thing that they can control is themselves right so understanding and being responsible as much as they can with their own actions. I don't know to what extent that's possible because like I said, you know, the key thing is that some of them are only the creators are still learning what these things can do. You know, there's definitely risk there. I think there are opportunities and risk. Understood. So my last question for today is as AI continues to advance, there are concerns about bias and fairness in AI system and how can leaders address these concerns and ensure that AI is developed and deployed in an unbiased and equitable way within their organizations i don't know that that's possible because it is an inherent you know if it's coming from human experience there is going to be bias there i don't know if it's possible to fully remove that um i mean i guess in an ideal world we would be able to achieve that right but it's never going to be 100% ideal or perfect and i think that it's about looking at well what can we live with and you know we don't live in a perfect world right now we don't have an ideal world and it's you know these same areas that are being magnified you know through through ai right that's the the biggest thing that i can see happening right right and i again resonate with that because 
have been conducting a lot of research in terms of uh, how we can successfully mitigate some form of bias and like how to harness this kind of fairness in AI solutions. But as you said, like it's very difficult with the data which we create ideally because the data is purely our data and our personal data and like how personal experiences over the history. So, and that contains bias for sure, actually. I think, you know, just to, perhaps just adding new data on a continuous basis may help in some way. And this is one of the things I, I touched on this morning, actually, with the person I was talking to, because we talked about clinical data. And often that's gathered from adults, right? Not from children and not from the elderly. So there's already a bias to the data in medications, whether something can be effective or safe. So that's a great example, right? That if that data is gathered for those populations and added on an ongoing basis, then we start to get a larger data pool and we start to remove some of that bias in the data. So that covered all my questions, Cassia, and thank you so much for actually being here this late to answer all my, my questions, actually. And uh, Yeah, I feel like I've given you some very long-winded questions, but you asked some big, <laughs> I mean, answers, so you've asked some big questions, and I'm usually the one asking the questions, so... 